In this session of Look at the Book, we're going to focus on Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 27. And the question we're posing is, can you find a precious promise that has wonderful contemporary application in the midst of a poetic section that is filled with strange words and images. <laughs> there is none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Father, as we struggle with some of these strange words and unusual images, grant that the beauty and applicability of this promise would shine through for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's probably good when we are looking at a promise like this to get the context and Probably you run into this. I ran into this just in the last day, uh, reading through Deuteronomy. And so the context just before is blessings uh, given by Moses on the 12 tribes. He takes each tribe one at a time and pronounces blessings on them. And, and then what follows it is a concluding promise of, of safety and security. And in the middle here is this transitional uh, promise made by Moses. There is none like God, O Jeshurun. And <laughs> we do, don't say, well, who, what in the world is, does that mean? Now, when you run into a word like that, which you don't have any idea what it means, what, what do you do? Well, you can do one of four things. You can use a concordance, which I think is the first thing you should do. And that is a concordance tells you all the places where this word is used. It's used only three other times, and we'll look at them in just a minute. Or you can use your uh, study Bible notes, the bottom of the page. If you have a good study Bible, that's helpful and quick. Or you can use a Bible dictionary that's good to have on hand. Or, if you're really sophisticated, you can poke around to find out what did, how did the, the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, how did it translate it? And interestingly enough, it translates it as beloved. And it's never translated that way in our English versions. But beloved was the way they picked the Hebrew word apart and gave it meaning. Here, here are the other three places. Deuteronomy 32, 15. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat. So you. So Jeshurun is probably another name for Israel. You grew fat and stout and sleek. And then he forsook God who made him made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. So Jeshurun seems to be a, a, a designation for Israel and it draws attention to the fact that God made him and his, his, is his Savior. 33, Deuteronomy 33, 5, Thus the Lord became king in Jeshurun. He became king in Israel. There's another name for Israel somehow. When the heads of the people were gathered together, all the tribes of Israel. So a name, perhaps, that is used when all the tribes are being considered. One other place, Isaiah 44, 2. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. So there's a strong confirmation that uh, another name for Jacob or Israel is being used. So that's pretty much what scholars know. Now you're up, now you're a scholar. Only there is a Hebrew word, of course, behind it, and you can try to take it apart and see what it refers to like the Septuagint people did. But let's just say uh, it is a, another name 
for Israel, used by God, perhaps signifying a, a strong affection and his readiness to be his, his rock and his, his savior. So it raises the question, can we apply this to us? And there's a note, I think, at the bottom on the website that sends you to a lab that I did to try to explain why Gentile Christians can take promises like this. I think if you are in Christ and all the promises are yes in him, a promise like this can be yours. So let's let's continue on and see what else we find. Therefore, there is none like God, O Jeshurun, and this God rides through the heavens to your help. He, he, he rides on a chariot, not a airplane, through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. So the first image is of, of God who's, who's riding through the skies. Strange image for God. Or here's another one. The eternal God is your dwelling place. Here's another one. And underneath are the everlasting arms. So this God in this verse is a, a chariot rider, and he's a house, and he has arms with which he catches you. Now, when you're reading a section like this and you bump into numerous multiplied images like that, you know you're into poetry, and you know you need to not take these things with literalness, meaning God really does have a body and a chariot and really does uh, turn into a house and he really does have arms and, and legs. But rather, you need to ask then, okay, if I've, if I've got three images here of, of my God and nobody else is like him, what do they signify? And you need to pause and think. And this is where things get really sweet. Uh, he rides through the heavens. He rides through the skies to come and, and help you. Wouldn't that imply that he's, he's quick, he's, he's fast, and he's uh, uh, free and unhindered? So if he's flying, he's not getting stuck in the mud. He's not getting stuck in, in woods. He's not getting stuck in any traffic. He is going to arrive on time because he is flying to your help. He's a dwelling place, which means he's, he's close, even in um, domestic non-war times. I mean, you might call him a refuge, but here it's just a dwelling place. He, we live in him all the time. And everlasting arms, he is, he is strong to catch us when we fall or when we're, when we're weak. Another thing I do then when looking at this is ask about contrasts. And, and what I saw was majesty coming to my help. I'm just so small and insignificant. And he's riding through the heavens, through the skies in his majesty. And yet he's coming to your help. And that's just enormously valuable to think about. He's, he's a helper, means he gets down low with us in our problems and, and deals with what we're dealing with, and he does it as a majestic God. He doesn't have to forsake being majestic in order to be a helper, and in order to be a helper, he doesn't have to be uh, small and insignificant to fit in our little problems. He can stay majestic. And the last thing I note is this phrase, there is none like him. And I wonder, what is it about him here that causes Moses to say he's unique? He is absolutely unique among all the beings of the universe, among all the gods. And it may well be this issue of he's majestic and willing to step down to help the lowly and be their dwelling place and be arms underneath them. And that caused me to remember Isaiah 64, 4, where you have another statement of uniqueness. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No one, no eye has seen a God besides you. Now, what's unique about this God? Well, what's unique is he works for those who wait for him. 
So here you have an absolutely unique God in that he uses his divine power to work for those who wait for him. Many gods do the opposite. They show their authority by saying, okay, you lowly human beings, you, you will now work for me. And I'll wait to see if you perform good enough for me. And our God works for those who say, I can't work for myself. I have to wait on my God. So what's unique here, I think, is that we have an absolutely majestic God who in his majesty rides quickly and freely to help us in whatever situ situation we are and becomes a, a dwelling place for us and in our weakness catches us when we fall. It is a very precious promise amidst all of its strangeness.